The novel we are focusing on today wasn't expected to become the opus it eventually became. But when Joyce Carol Oates began writing the story, she found herself unable to stop, for better or worse. Though there is some truth to the tale, she writes in the introduction to the book that to call it nonfiction would be misleading. Her intention was to write the story of one of America's most famous icons, Marilyn Monroe, but write it in such a way that it would encompass its boundaries and become a reflection of an American life. The life portrayed is tragic, hopeful, strange, and at times unnerving. And as Oates hoped it would, it has connected with many readers and stands as one of her most well-known and praised novels. There is little doubt that Joyce Carol Oates is a powerhouse of a writer. Her novels, of which there are 60, are still being discovered, studied, analyzed, and praised. The way she has successfully blended fiction with nonfiction, her use of multiple points of view, and her unusual and experimental style of storytelling continues to fascinate and captivate. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, authors, and obsessions. I am your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and today we are diving into the fictionalized biography of one of America's biggest icons, Blonde. Reading is the sole means by which we slip, involuntarily, often helplessly, into another's skin, another's voice, another's soul. End quote. Blonde, Joyce Carol Oates' 34th novel, was first published in the year 2000. Here is a synopsis of the novel to entice the mind or refresh the memory. A mesmerizing novel of the most enduring cultural icon of the 20th century, Blonde is a deeply moving portrait of the woman who became Marilyn Monroe. Who was Norma Jean Baker? In Blonde, we are given an intimate, unsparing vision of the woman who became Marilyn Monroe like no other. The child who visits the cinema with her mother, the orphan whose mother is declared mad, the woman who changes her name to become an actress, the faded celebrity, lover, comedian, muse, and icon. Joyce Carol Oates tells an epic American story of how a fragile yet gifted young woman makes and remakes her identity, surviving against crushing odds, perpetually in conflict and intensely driven. Here is the very essence of the individual hungry and needy for love, from an elusive mother, from a mysterious, distant father, and from a succession of lovers and husbands. Oates sympathetically explores the inner life of the woman destined to become Hollywood's most compelling legend. Blonde is a brilliant and deeply moving portrait of a culture hypnotized by its own myths and the shattering reality of the personal effects it had on the woman who became Marilyn Monroe. Joyce Carol Oates was born on June 16, 1938, as the eldest of three children to parents of Hungarian descent. She grew up with two younger siblings in the farming community of Millersport, New York, and describes her family as being happy, close-knit, and unextraordinary for their time, place, and economic status. Her father often had two jobs in order to support his family while her mother took care of the children. This was quite commonplace in the Catholic milieu where she grew up and would leave an imprint in her psyche, one that would inspire future books. One positive aspect of growing up on a farm was the work habits that were instilled in her. There were always a series of never-ending chores and tasks to do on the farm, which means that the family was constantly working. As an adult, she would find herself very unhappy if she had nothing to work on which goes to explain how prolific she is in regards to writing. Young Joyce was interested in telling stories even before she could write and thus would draw pictures to get her stories across. 
When she learned to read, her fascination with literature only intensified, which did not go undetected by her grandmother, Blanche. Blanche lived with the family, and she and Joyce were especially close. On one occasion, Blanche gave her granddaughter a copy of Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland as a present. Joyce would go on to describe the book as being a great treasure of her childhood, as well as the most profound literary influence of her life. It was the first book the young writer to be truly loved, and one she read to the point of memorizing it. In her teen years, she continued to expand her love of literature by reading the works of Charlotte Bronte, Emily Bronte, Fyodor Dostoevsky, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, and Henry David Thoreau, all of which influenced her profoundly. At age 14, she was given a typewriter by her grandmother, Blanche. With a typewriter of her own, teenage Joyce immediately began writing and was soon receiving recognition for it by winning a Scholastic Art and Writing Award. In 1953, at age 15, she wrote her very first novel. Its subject matter concerned the rehabilitation of a drug addict and was deemed too depressing for a teenage audience and was subsequently rejected by publishers. But for Joyce Carol Oates, this was only the beginning. After becoming the very first of her family to complete high school when she graduated from Williamsville South High School in 1956, she attended Syracuse University on a scholarship. It was there she began training herself to become a writer. She did this by writing novel after novel, but always throwing the completed works in the garbage bin, a very bold move that one imagines must have taken a painful amount of discipline. But the objective, it seems, was to get better, not linger or get caught up in the works. Around the same time, she began reading the writings of Franz Kafka, D. H. Lawrence, Thomas Mann, and Flannery O'Connor, all writers that would influence her future works. She graduated from Syracuse University in 1960 with a BA in English and received her MA from the University of Wisconsin the following year. She was a Ph.D. student at Rice University in Houston, Texas, when she felt that her writing was at a level where she wanted to pursue it full-time and made a decision to leave the university with the mission of becoming a full-time writer. Soon thereafter, she met Evelyn Schiff, the president of Vanguard Press. Schiff thought Oates was nothing short of a genius and published her first book, the short story collection, By the North Gate, in 1963. The following year, when she was 26 years old, Vanguard published her first official novel, With Shuddering Fall. She would continue on to write prolifically thereafter. Quote, we work in the dark. We do what we can. We give what we have. Our doubt is our passion and our passion is our task. The rest is the madness of art." End quote. Sometime in the mid to late 1990s, Oates found the desire to start writing what would become the novel Blonde after she happened to see a photograph of a 15-year-old Norma Jean Baker. Still a lifetime away from becoming Marilyn Monroe, and therefore looking completely different than the pop culture icon she would later be molded into, Norma Jean had shoulder-length curly brown hair and was wearing what appeared to be a crown of artificial flowers. Apparently it was taken when she competed in a beauty pageant. There was something about her look, her gaze, it connected with Oates. The girl in that photograph seemed so familiar similar to many of the girls she grew up with in northern New York. The girl in the photograph wasn't Marilyn Monroe. She was just another girl, one of many in America, and Oates felt the desire to give life to this lost, lone girl, give life to a past that existed before Norma Jean became little more than a product. As a writer, she had found the spark she was after. Initially, before she settled on fictionalizing the story of Norma Jean Baker, she had planned to write a novella about the metamorphosis of an ordinary high school girl who was suddenly cast into stardom. 
Throughout her journey, she would lose her real name and be given a different one by the same production studio that would obliterate her history and identity. The planned novella was supposed to end with the words, Marilyn Monroe, revealing to the reader who they had been reading about all along. But as she went into the research stage, watching all of Monroe's movies and learning more about the person behind the iconic figure, finding out about her intelligence and humor, as well as learning about her determination to be seen as a serious actress, Oates understood that it would have to be the story of Norma Jean Baker, even if it was seen through a fictional lens. She soon realized that she needed a larger fictional form to explore the woman who had been at the forefront of mid-20th century American culture when it came to sports, religion, Hollywood, crime, theater, and politics. Norma Jean was so much more than the victim she was often portrayed as, and Oates was intent on showing and exploring all the other attributes she had found out about the girl who would become such a household name. If you've already read the novel, you know that she utilized an intriguing style in the telling of the story. The piece breaks from traditional fiction by exploring the realms of narration. While most of the story is told in the traditional third-person narrative, it also jumps to other characters, using their first-person accounts to explore elements and add layers to the story. Interspersed throughout the book are also passages from Norma Jean's fictionalized journal written naturally in the first person. In addition to this, some chapters have a dreamlike quality to them, as if they are coming from the subconscious of Norma Jean's mind. This all adds up to quite the intriguing and, at times, challenging novel, which is surely the reason it is still studied as well as praised. Oates, by her own admission, did not do extensive research on Marilyn Monroe as she never intended the novel to be a biography or a non-fiction book. What she did do was make an outline of Monroe's life, one that permitted her to include other era-appropriate elements, such as politics, into the novel as well. Utilizing this outline, she knew where the story was headed at all times, as well as where she was in the timeline of Norma Jean Baker's life. Despite feeling a great drive when she wrote the novel, it is also an experience she would rather not relive. She would go on to explain that though she felt a morbid excitement and a radiating energy throughout the process, the writing process was also all-encompassing and took over her life. She could simply not stop thinking about the novel or stop writing it. It became an obsession. Later analyzing herself... She believes that her obsession revolved around giving life to the Norma Jean she had created, the Norma Jean who was not Marilyn Monroe, but who reflected the lives and aspirations of so many young girls in America. She would later say in an interview that the great tragedy of Norma Jean Baker's life was that her mother never loved her, and neither did she have a father. Even as Norma Jean became Marilyn Monroe and was a star on the rise, her father never acknowledged her, so it never really mattered how famous she became, or how successful, or how beautiful, because she was lacking that early love and sense of protection. This was surely something that many readers could relate to, if not identify with, in one sense or another. The novella, as it was intended to be when Oates first embarked on the project, was estimated to clock in around 175 pages. But when she began writing it, and she got caught up in its world and, more specifically, the life of Norma Jean Baker, she found it impossible to relinquish it until it had run its course. When finished, the book was 1,400 pages long, and most of it had been written and revised in less than a year. The reason given for why half of the novel would be cut from the final edition is mainly because of the rights that were already sold in foreign countries, where the novel would immensely increase in length in the process of being translated. The 1,400 pages could easily escalate to 2,000 pages or more in certain countries, which was not ideal marketing-wise. She intended to have the pages that had been removed published at a later date, but as of the recording of this episode, this has yet to occur. 
When Joyce Carol Oates embarks on a new novel, she first begins by jotting down a lot of notes. She then uses these notes to form an outline. When she has an outline she likes, she goes on to the first draft, which is written in longhand. With the completion of the first draft, she moves to the computer. From then on, rewrites and revisions are in order. When subjecting oneself to a novel of such length as Blonde, one of the most important elements becomes the necessity to keep the narrative voice consistent and fluid throughout the book. This is accomplished by staying in the moment, which might explain her necessity to obsess over the book. In the process of writing Blonde, she went back and forth, continually writing new pages as well as rewriting chapters she had written earlier. In the last phase of writing the novel, she would rewrite the first pages of the book while at the same time focusing on the last 200 pages. This assured her that there was a consistency to the narrative voice. She found this technique to work so well that she recommends it to other writers. Now, in regards to her writing routine, there are different answers, most likely because she has been writing for as long as she has. One can only imagine that her routine has gone through some changes through the years. Setting a basis during an interview from 2013, she states that she likes to start as early as possible, preferably around 7 a.m. while she looks out at the garden from her study. If the writing goes smoothly and she doesn't have to take a break, she has breakfast around 2 or 3 in the afternoon. Those days are considered good writing days. However, on days when the writing flow isn't as fluid or she is interrupted for any sort of reason, she still writes, though intermittently, throughout the day when the chance presents itself. She never keeps track of how many words she's written in a day, nor does she have a goal of how many words to write each day. That which appears on the paper is all that matters. She writes every day, and the first drafts of all her novels are written longhand. As mentioned in the episode about Neil Gaiman's American Gods, writing longhand is a slower process, one that requires more forethought, but one that can ultimately result in a much more satisfying product. Once she has drained herself of writing for the day, the evening is usually spent reading, which she does voraciously. Concerning the themes she chooses to write about, she does detect somewhat of a common thread, specifically when it comes to the identification of women and children, and particularly when they have been victims of violence. Further solidifying this notion, Oates has stated that she looks at the role of a writer as a witness who is able to tell the story of someone who isn't able to do it themselves. When it comes to the actual act of writing, she considers beginning a novel as starting across a river on a placid day. It's a beautiful day and the water is calm, so you get in the water. And there you are, swimming calmly until an undertow or a current pulls you in a different direction than the one you were intending to go. So suddenly, you're flailing about. You thought it would be easy, but now it seems like life and death. You can't sleep because you're thinking so much about it. Your heart beats erratically. Then finally, after months and months and months of this, in order to get the draft done, it feels like such an achievement. It feels as if you can now die peacefully, knowing that the huge effort is behind you. If she ever becomes stuck on a particular point, she goes for a walk up a hill near where she lives. Either that or she goes for a run. Both of these activities allow her space to envision the continuation of the novel. Needing to be alone with her thoughts to figure out the solution is vital, and if given the option, she prefers a big hill. Her talent for writing fast is oftentimes at the forefront of focus when it comes to her craft. Touching on how she is able to write with such velocity... Oates has explained that she only does one project at a time. She has said that one can compare her writing process to a gourmet cook who spends hours in the kitchen in order to make only one meal. This allows her to put her entire heart and soul into the project ahead of her. 
and from that intense focus, velocity is nurtured. While she has stated that she's never experienced writer's block, she has admitted to going through some difficult periods. She has no problems imagining stories, characters, distinctive setting, or themes, but the difficulty has revealed itself at times when it comes to choosing the right voice and language in which to present it. That being said, she usually finds writing to be a pleasure, which is why she does it with such proclivity. Blonde was published in the year 2000 and was quickly nominated for literary prizes and widely reviewed as Oates' masterwork by both reviewers and her fans. Her extensive bibliography contains poetry, plays, criticism, short stories, 11 novellas, and 60 novels, some of which are published under her pseudonyms, Rosamond Smith and Lauren Kelly. In one of her journals from 1973, she makes a point of not seeking out reviews of her works. If she happens to stumble upon one in a magazine she just so happens to be reading, she doesn't shy away from it. However, she will not seek them out either. Joyce Carol Oates has remained well-grounded despite her success and has only a faint idea of how many books she sold, how much their earnings have been from each one, or even how many books she has written in total. She knows that she could easily find this out if she wanted to, but she has no interest in knowing any of it. I will leave you with one final quote from the woman who had a strong desire to tell her stories even before she could write. I have forced myself to begin writing when I have been utterly exhausted when I felt my soul as thin as a playing card, and somehow the activity of writing changes everything. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin. I, along with my fellow producers of this podcast, ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words. Until next time, keep turning those pages. 